We got Lane McRae here from Labouche. Yes, sir. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Good. Good. I saw your performance last night. You're here in Toronto. That was all right. How do you feel? I feel good. You know, anytime we get an opportunity to, to be on stage and to share what we do, it's right. always a pleasure. Um, and especially here in Canada, since Canada was one of the first places to recognize us and, you know, enter the charts and right. um, support us. From the very beginning. Okay. All right. You've been doing this for how long? Ooh, 30 years. 30 years now. 30 years. Right. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the beginning, because I know that, I mean, I interviewed you a few years ago, mm -hmm. um, and I remember, I just want to get more into depth, right? Tell me about groove makings. Groove of, groove and Affairs? Groove and Affairs, yeah, sorry. Uh, groove and Affairs, when I first moved to Europe in 1991, Groove and Affairs was a cover band that Melanie and I were in. Right. Uh, and we were doing stuff like, you know, Prince, Michael Jackson, um, Covers. Shaka Khan, Whitney Houston, what have you. And uh, we were a performance band. It was like a seven piece band, Melanie and myself. Yeah. And we were working usually Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, I was making about four or 500 German marks a night, which, you know, for me, who was in the military at the time, that was some great extra cash to have. Right, right. Um, and then subsequently during that time, we, Melanie was working with Uli Brenner and Amir Seraf um, on this project. And she asked me if I'd be interested in joining in. I was like, yeah, absolutely. And though I had never been inside a studio, you know, I was like, okay. So for me, it was a kind of a learning experience. And so going from um, group affairs to this project and then having this song come out, uh, Sweet Dreams that started to take traction, um, you know, the band subsequently started being able to ask for more money um, and become more visible on the scene. Right, right, right. And going back, you you know, we spoke with, about this before. You, you you were in the military, right? You grew up in the U.S., Yes. Right? And then you joined the Air Force. You went to, to Europe? Yeah, right? well, my dad was in the Army. So, okay. you know, we traveled around a lot. We were in Hawaii. We had been in Germany, um, all across the U.S. And... Um, and then, of course, you know, I joined the Air Force at 18, and I got out there and was in New Jersey, um, and then I was stationed in Korea, I was stationed back in Germany, um, stationed in Turkey. Right. And while in the military, you know, I was involved in the Air Force entertainment group called Thompson Blue that was like a 30-man performance troupe that performed at all these military installations around the world. Okay. Which I think was my training for LaBouche. Right. So. Yeah. So when that opportunity came along, it was like I was ready for it. You're ready for it. Um, so if, if let's say, if, for example, LaBouche didn't pan out, what would have your life had to go? You know, I often wonder that. I mean, yeah. I mean, because obviously I had to get out of the military. Right. And even going into LaBouche, the questions, I took a piece of paper and I drew a line down the middle. What are the pros and what are the cons? Okay. The cons were, okay, I still have child support payments. I still got car payments. I still have, you know, bills to, for rent, uh, credit card payments, blah, 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 blah. And I'm a man of faith, so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to step out on that and see what happens. If it hadn't worked out, I don't know. You know, um, I'm educated. I've got a degree in logistical management, so I probably just would have found a job and, and moved on with my life somehow. Um, but music would always have been a part of it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, it's it's pretty interesting thinking of like alternate you know realities yeah. based on if, if something didn't. Well, turn even out. now at this point, after, yeah. after all these years, you know, I always ask people, you know, what is it that you are good at? What is it that you're willing to sacrifice? And a lot of people, um, I mean, the reality of it, you know, we all have to sustain and live. And music ebbs and flows. You know, mm -hmm. it goes and it comes. You know, yeah. and what you do in the downtime, some people can't let go of the the used to be fame that they once had and sometimes you have to be realistic about it and you have to go back to work right you know yeah. and even for me after melanie died i took two years off of doing absolutely nothing right um well i'll say absolutely nothing I, I did a lot of um drinking you know a lot of uh, just trying to deal with the loss yeah um i went to culinary school right yeah you know, around a restaurant okay um so I've never been afraid to get my hands dirty and learn a new trade. Right, right. Know? So um, I've done all that. And then the music came back around and uh, jumped back out there. Had some naysayers. Um, 
Labouche was dead, died with Bounty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you saying that yeah. you went to your old manager yeah. and agent, uh, yeah. agent yeah. right? Yeah. And then uh, he's like, uh, well, you, you expressed the interest to like start touring again or performing. Yeah. And he was like, well, yeah, Labouche is dead. Labouche died yeah. with Melanie, right? And that was a tough pill to yeah. swallow. But, yeah. you know, I don't begrudge him for saying that because I've never listened to anyone about my career or what I need to do because I'm going to do what I have to. Right, right. And the thing is, is that, well, you you um, you took a risk back when, when you were in the military to join this group right mm -hmm. obviously you had responsibilities and everything and then you you've taken risks all throughout your life right like even Thank even you. after melody right? uh and doing what you're doing now right mm -hmm. so um you okay so uh you were doing these performances you know um these these, these cover band performances right and then how did that transition into labouche well, so, uh, Melanie was working with Lily uh, really? Brenner yeah. and Amir Sarah. Yeah. And they had done a couple of songs, uh, one of which was Sweet Dreams. Uh, the other one was Tonight is the Night. Right. And when I came on board, um, these songs had already been done to completion. Okay. Tonight is the Night was shopped around to Logic Records in Germany. Okay. And this is with Melanie's voice. Sweet Dreams, nobody in Germany wanted. So Uli sent it to one of his friends at Scorpio Music in Paris. They passed on it. That guy sent it to a radio DJ friend of his in Italy. Mm -hmm. He started playing it on the radio, and it quickly shot up to number one. So we went down to, um, to Italy to do this festival called Festival Bar, and there was probably 60,000 people. Oh, my God. And no one had even seen what Labushi didn't look like because there was no video out at the time. Right. There's no press out about it. Yeah, yeah. And we get there and we've got about twenty security people with their arms interlocked around me and Melly and we're like, like what's going on? You know? Is Michael Jackson here? Is Madonna here? You know, what's up? <laughs> right. Um, but they were there for us. As soon as that first note hit down down, the crowd just went wild. And it was um so that transition, you know, from doing Grooving Affairs and Labouche, um was kind of combined because we brought them along as our house band for the booth. So we just started doing that song in our show. Um, and, you know, we started getting this big following, you know, and subsequently the label, BMG, and a lot of the labels were considering acts like us, um, just acts, not artists. And so we ended up doing, um, begging them to give us an opportunity to show them that we can do a live answer because we have been doing it for months right and so we set up in berlin and we did that and they were just oh my god this is fantastic you know so it kind of separated us from the rest of the the other artists that were out there the dancers at the time right so you mentioned that when you came in the song was finished but what was missing was your your part Right. And, and, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. tonight is like well, that was done with Melanie and a guy named Romeo. Okay. That was a rapper on that song. Okay. Uh, Sweet Dreams was done with Melanie and a guy named Robert Haynes. Okay. So I re-recorded what he did, um, and then subsequently everything from that point on was was me. Okay. Um, because he was with, he was the artist that was signed to the Click. Okay. With Kyle. Right. So it was some, you know, not shenanigans, but some contractual things that had to be separated. And um, and so you know, Be My Lover comes along, you know, and I was lucky enough to you know co-write seven of those. I'm curious to hear the original song. <laughs> you know, it's probably lost or something. Uh, well, know? no, it's it's out there, uh, but yeah. you can't really tell much of the difference between what he and I did. Okay, though, because, okay. Uh, I wanted it to sound not so far from the the original okay. version of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, what, what's really interesting in, in in you noting is that the label shopped around or uh, they were shopping around for the song you guys were sending it to different labels and everything mm -hmm. um and nobody wanted it yeah but italy some some dj in italy yep played it some dj yeah what do you think what do, what do you take from that well that whoever's listening to, to music it's subjective to whoever's listening to right. whether they like it or not right. you know and sometimes you know we're quick to even when i hear music i don't judge it immediately like uh, currently we have this new David Guetta remix out. Right. When the publisher approached me about signing off on the approval, I said, well, I need to hear it first. Right. Yeah. When I heard it, it didn't bowl me over, to be honest. Yeah. But 
after I listened to it two or three more times, it started to grow on me. Okay. So I think there's different approaches. Where like when you hear stuff, it either goes bam, yeah, or it kind of sneaks up on you, and then you get the bam. So um, the fact that you know folks didn't like Sweet Dreams, um, and certainly compared to some of the other things that were out at the time, yeah, yeah. was a was a brain misnomer for me because um, it was a good song. Right. I mean, even still today, obviously. Even yeah, yeah, yeah. It. It's still played everywhere. Yeah. Um, have, have you met Ghetto? Have not met him. Oh, okay, okay. But I certainly have put my my hat off there to do any guest appearances with him at some of these festivals. Ah, okay. Uh, my producer, Frank Farian, has just signed a deal with him. Okay. Um, for remixes for some of his groups or possi right. possibly new songs. I don't know the details of it, but right, 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 right. Um, he's still out there doing his thing. Um, but the fact that be my lover has been done so many times over right. the years and i always say if you're going to do a cover you've got to reimagine it it can't be the same note for note yeah. version that we already hear yeah so what are your thoughts on uh, and, and, and building on what you said like what are your thoughts uh, like have you always been for that where they should remake them or well, I think it's, I mean, a, it's a it's a compliment to yeah. the artist that does it originally. Yeah. If somebody wants to cover what you're doing. Yeah. Um, that seems to be the trend now. They've done a Hathaway. Yeah. They've they've done like I can think uh, Tiesto did Aqua the other day or something. Yeah. Like, Shaka Khan. I mean, it's, it's always yeah, yeah, I yeah. think what they're doing now is back in the day, people were taking you know dance music songs and kind of reinventing them like in the R and B urban world, right? Okay. Yeah. Like your. Um, Kelly Rowland, um, when Love Takes Over, right, or yeah. Neo, or um, yeah. Chris Brown, or yeah, Rush yeah. or somebody. Yeah, yeah. Now, with what I'm hearing, trending is either a musical hook from a song from the '90s that people recognize, and rewriting a lyric on top of it, right? Oh or, yeah, or doing the lyric hook of a song that we all know with a different. You know, music yeah, composition around. like uh, Eiffel 65, Blue. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I got that going on. But um, going back to, uh, you know, to Sweet Dreams, do you think that somebody in Italy picked it up because maybe this style of music was bigger there than anywhere else? Uh, like, I don't know if like it's that. Euro it just, pop kind of. It just was an infectious song that I think right. um, it was at the right time at the right place. Right. You know, and. You know, at the end of the year, when they do this festival, they have like all the, like the countdown for the top, you know, I don't know, 50, 100 songs that have been yeah. played from, you know, Joe Conker, Bon Jovi, um, Bonnie Tyler, right. you know, the Bush, and to be even mentioned in the pantheon of those great artists, you know, right, it was right, like right. a, it was humbling, you know, and the right. following year we went back with uh, Be My Lover, yeah, and um but yeah, at the right time, at the right place, you know, right place, right time is essential, I think, to anything succeeding. Mm -hmm. um, and who's pushed it nowadays? You know, to get a song on the radio is like pulling teeth. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teeth or money. But even saying. now, uh, it seems like radio. Um, yeah, it's still effective, but I think a lot of streaming platforms and word of mouth is probably just yeah. as effective now yeah. with spreading music. But it requires a whole lot of work, you know, and to constantly be social, the high social media, yeah, 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 plugging stuff, you know, it's it's a twenty four seven job, you know, right, right. So, um, so you said that there were, uh, you know, at this this first event uh, in Italy, there were like sixty thousand people. Yeah, what was going on through your head? Because you you weren't used to it, you know, like at this point in time, where you kind of like, okay, well, <laughs> this is a one off. You know, or what? Yeah, honestly, I was just overwhelmed. I just knew that I love performing. You know, yeah, yeah, I yeah. love being in front of people. Yeah. Um, and anytime that I opened my mouth to rap, the kids were screaming. And I loved that adulation. I loved that feeling. Right. Uh, so I was always giving more. Um, and then always, you know, it's after it's over, it's, man, I want to do that again. You know, and it, it, it ends up being. Um, as you go through it, it's like a drug. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's like a drug. Yeah, it's a very addictive thing. And yeah. so sometimes you'll get to a venue or and you start performing, and the people aren't as not as into it. Right. Yeah. And so you have to go to work. No, yeah. to win them over. Right. <clears throat> so it's um, 
And I remember specifically when we came to the U.S., um, we were playing a club in Boston. It was a hip-hop club. Okay. The announcer announced us with all this fervor, international pop recording artist, RCA, blah, 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 bouge. And it was like, yeah, people just kind of sitting back, kind of chill. It's okay. <coughs> so I told Melanie, we're going to have to go to work on this one to win these people over, you know? So as the show progressed and we started performing, you know, we, we did win them over, but yeah, yeah. it's never a, an absolute, you know, that they're just going to be screaming and hollering for you just because you're who you are, you know? So, right, right. So I, I appreciate that about them. Right. The um, the biggest challenges uh, that I see, because I, I, I know a lot of one-hit wonders, right? Okay. You know, look, look at Vanilla Ice. Look at, no. look at, look at Eiffel 65, you know? No. Look at all these, all these artists that have hit, put one hit out and then the other hits have not been as great yeah, but no. you guys have had multiple hits yeah. right after sweet dreams what came um after sweet dreams uh was be my lover be my lover right uh, after be my lover was um fall in love fall in love sos sos i love to love right but be my lover was pivotal <coughs> you know if, uh -huh. if 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 you thought sweet dreams was big be my lover was astronomical right yeah. tell me about that like what was what like tell me well be my lover was one of those kind of songs that you know when we get the um going to the studio to listen to it yeah um i remember you telling me that the the hook uh yeah. wasn't even there you guys were trying to figure out words mm -hmm. right but i guess the uh yeah. was, you know when you're songwriting you know you're coming like with these melodies and you just put the words to what you're right doing. yeah and those words were actually pretty easy to do because melody and i had had a conversation backstage during one of the um, pauses in the Drew and Affairs show. And um, she asked me about relationships, business and pleasure. Oh, yeah. And I said, well, you know, from my experience that it doesn't really work. Um, can we take a quick pause and grab some water? No worries, man. Yeah, so um, that whole um, process of, you know, having this conversation with Melanie backstage about business and pleasure, and, and it had been my experience that um, having dated on a, another tour when I was in the military with someone that she was pissed off at me, and we come out on stage, and a part that we were supposed to have this interaction doesn't even look at me, was deflating. So I said, I never want to experience that again. So she said, okay, well. So you were against it at first, like back in the day, when you first yeah, yeah, with because, the other person, right? Yes. You were against it. You didn't want to mix it. I didn't want to do that because, yeah. you know, it's always... Um, creates problems down the road. It's a, it's a horrible feeling to be on stage and you know you're supposed to have this interaction with someone and they're just, and they're just ignoring you. Yeah, yeah. So with Melanie, it was... Um, I didn't want to close the door on that possibility because there were some, some groups out there like your... Sunny Share, Marvin and Tammy, right, yeah. Captain and Tenille, um, that worked. Yeah, yeah. And so we're in the studio. Looking back on all the time that we spent together, you ought to know by now if you want to be my lover. I, sh I should know that by now. And I was like, well, you know, I hear what you say and I, I see what you do, but I need a little bit more time, you know, before I can make that decision. But I do want you to know what it's telling me is that you, you want to be my lover. I get it. And, um, and then, like you said earlier, the la da 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 da, -da, -da part. Yeah. We just couldn't put any words to it, so we left it there. Right. So that subsequently has been, you know, our biggest hit, you know. And man, to have co-written that and to have it last these many years is incredible. Yeah, definitely. And um, once that song was released, I mean, obviously, w w was there any expectation for this to be bigger or? You know, at this point, you know, we're just kind of going with the flow, right. um, trusting the label to do what they do. Right. Um, they had gotten it on, you know, movie soundtracks, you know. Um, yeah, yes, yes, that's, yeah. Where I, that's where I heard it. Yeah. I mean, even today, I was, um, some, I guess it was last, last year, um, Downy Unstoppables, you know, the laundry softener or something. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think yeah. I saw that. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. Uh, and I actually do use those things. So I was like, let me write this company to see if I can't get on the next commercial. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Pam and Tommy 
on the Hulu series. Right. We were on there. I think Crystal Waters was also on that. Um, Night at the Roxbury, Michelle yeah. Romy's High School Reunion. Right, yeah. Um, and, and constantly there's requests coming in from my publisher to use it for different TV shows and movies. Right. And I'm like, I mean, it's just like the gift that keeps giving. You know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and obviously, at that point, you were touring the world, right? Yes. Performing these two tracks, yep. right? Um, massive arenas selling out. Um, what came next after that? You guys, uh, you, guys, you guys went back to the recording studio, fall in love, right? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of has like a similar format as uh, well, Be My Lover. Yeah, I think uh, Fall in Love was a, was a cover from 1975. Oh, is it? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, know you I like know. that one. <laughs> yeah, 1975, yeah. Hamilton, Joe Franklin Reynolds. Okay. Um, and the one of the guys had passed away the year that the song came out, the last remaining guy of the group. Right. And he paid us a huge compliment by saying, of everyone that has ever covered it, this was the best cover he had heard. Oh, wow. And it had been done by, I think, um, David Hasselhoff had done it um, and some other people, but he really enjoyed our version of it. Right. Um, and, you know, that's where Frank Farring comes in. He's got a, a, an ear for these kinds of things, you know, and it's always, sometimes, you know, I'm like all about it. But sometimes I'm like, eh. But more often than not, he was always right. Right. Yeah. First name's Donald. Yes. <laughs> What's uh definition? World conqueror. You, but you, but you went with Lane, obviously, right? Middle lane, yeah. Okay. Uh, mostly because I was a junior, I was trying to identify differently from my father. Right. Are your parents still alive? Uh, my mother says. Yeah. Are you close to them? Yes. Okay. Is she in the U.S.? She is. Oh. That's one of the reasons why I'm currently in the middle of a. a I'm not leaving Europe, but I took a second residence in Chicago um, to be closer to my mom. Um, That's good. And my daughter, my grandkids, and your daughter. Yes. Oh, nice. So uh, to make it not be so about the work all the time. How old uh, is your daughter? Uh, my daughter is forty at the end of this month. Wow. Yeah. You look forty. <laughs> you look 40 man Thank i don't even mate. know yeah yeah but uh okay so yeah, about 20 to that 20, 21 22 years to that that's so. crazy uh so um you you live in germany mm -hmm. uh until this day you live in germany why do you decide to reside there like until now i guess well, i mean i spent most of my youth there as a kid yeah. because my father was in the military there right. um i just I don't know. When I moved over this time, I felt like um, some of the artists from the 30s and 40s, like Josephine Baker and uh, a lot of literary people that moved over there to escape the oppression that they were dealing with in America at the time. Right. right. Um, and, you know, we obviously still have some issues going on there. And so I feel just like a, I just feel like a human being in Europe. You know, I'm not looked at as a black man. You know, everyone that lives on the street that I live on. Um, knows me as Lane. They don't know me as this artist or what have you. Right. Um, everyone always speaks. Um, I love getting fresh pastries. I love getting fresh meat from the grocery store. It's a different culture. Different culture, you know. Um, healthcare, a whole different beast there. Everything there where I am, I live in France, Belgium, Holland, uh, Italy, Switzerland, Austria is, is all right there. In America, it's so vast that you have to travel thousands upon thousands of miles and get to somewhere new, you know, and a lot of Americans have never even left their state, let alone the country to see something else. Yeah. Um, and while I still love, you know, North America and the U S um, I just feel more at home right there. So what are your plans? You're just going to travel in between and then here yeah. and there, stay here, stay there. Yeah. Most of my downtime, um, if there is any, uh, will be spent in the U S mm -hmm. um, the U.S., Chicago, Toronto. Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're just throwing it in. I mean, it, you, know, you, know, you, got, you, you know, you got family here, sure, you know. You got a few friends here. Yeah, okay, um, cool. And then if I'm spending a block of time in Europe, you know, touring, I'll just have that my, my house there to, right. to lay my head down. Right. So a couple of years ago, you told me, uh, I mean, we uh, it was COVID, right? Mm -hmm. What were the biggest challenges during COVID? Because obviously, you, you know, you weren't performing anymore, uh, you know. Oh, the biggest challenges was... Um, the slowdown, you know, slowdown. the slowdown, um, because in our last gig that we did was in the UK on New Year's, 
Um, and then I think middle of the month, I was supposed to be in Tel Aviv for a Google conference mm -hmm. and then to Abu Dhabi. Some pretty big, big number of gigs, right? Mm -hmm. And all this stuff started getting canceled or pushed back or rescheduled. And it was just really difficult. And I was thinking about my money, my money, my money. Yeah, I thought to myself, well, you've been working since you were 13 years old. Mm -hmm. Chill out. So chill out, I did. Take a break. And uh, chilled out to the point where you know, I gained like 60 pounds, you know. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I think we all did. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't cute at all. I mean, I was like falling downstairs, you know, oh um, or bouncing downstairs. Um, musically, I was able to get inside myself and start writing some stuff and um, some real truthful, honest stuff about life, love, liberty, yeah, pursuit of yeah. happiness kind of stuff. So um, that was probably the biggest challenge. And then post-COVID, the biggest challenge was losing that weight. Losing that weight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, well, we have to do. Uh, we have to touch on on the Melanie Thornton situation, mm -hmm. right? Back in two thousand and one, obviously, um, deadly plane crash and everything. Um, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. No worries. Good meeting you. I'm coming to Buffalo. All right. That's where I live. We're a tiny city, but we're fine. So. All right. All right. I'm bigger. Um, obviously, Melanie Thornton back in two thousand and one, deadly plane crash. Uh, totally unexpected. You know, I'm sure there were plans for more things between you guys down the road. Um, tell me at that moment in time, what were things like? Uh, what was on the horizon? And also what were your feelings and thoughts when that happened? And, and you know. Well, at the time of her death, she had already um, launched a solo career. Right. And, um, and I was 100% behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, when she passed away, um, like any friend or family member, it was difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Las Vegas at the time when it happened, and a friend of mine called me, I think it was Crystal Waters. She asked if I knew anything about a plane crash. And I was like, no. And just as I hung the telephone up, there was a ticker tape that went across CNN, you know, American born singer, passes his way, blah, blah, blah. Um, me and Melody were, for the most part, married at the hip, you know, as far as our career went. So it was, it was devastating. Mm -hmm. um, and to this day, there's never a day that goes by that I don't think about her or wonder what could have been if she had still been around. Um, but it always lends me to the thinking of you never know what tomorrow brings for you. So it's important, it's so imperative that we live each day as if it were our last day. Mm -hmm. Um, because tomorrow's not promising any of us, you right. know, uh, and whether that's just having hateful, negative energy or unresolved issues with people, fix it. It's really simple, you know. Um, so we just um, continue to perform and honor her through the music. And um, I am planning on trying to create some kind of AI um, situation with her. I'm not sure to what level, but something it's just kind of still new to me. Yeah. But, um, what to incorporate in your shows? Yeah. Right. Uh, That'd be really cool. Um, but uh, when when she passed away, you said that uh, there were challenges because you... Okay, how long after she passed away did you want to restart the group? Uh, she passed away in 2001. Yeah. Uh, it probably was like 2005. 2005. But I was trying to go back to, to work. Yeah. What was your um, thought process between there? Like, were you just like, um, dude, I had numbed myself to the point. I mean, I said I was doing a lot of self-destructive behavior, you know, um, drinking um, to the point of just not even knowing where I was. You mm -hmm. know, it was that painful. And when I started to kind of uh, sober up and realize that, you know, this is not the way to go, I went back to work. Uh, and that involved a lot of hateful um, comments and stuff on YouTube, you know, um, the bush. Rest in peace, Melanie. Anything new that I try to do with <coughs> with Labouche, it was always met with. This is not Labouche. She's horrible. She's blah blah blah. They should just stop. And I'd always pose the question: Well, what would you have me do? Die, not live. Um, and then a few people started, you know, coming over into my side of the way of thinking. And I was like, you know, you just gotta keep moving on. And there are always going to be naysayers. There's always going to be people that don't like what you do. Uh, and I will be the first to say, I will never forget Melanie. I'll never forget the impact that we had on the industry. 
were the few shows that you started up again were they very difficult and uh were they challenging were people not coming out maybe or no people came out mm -hmm. and quite honestly there's a lot of people out there that didn't realize that melody had passed on okay you know your diehard fans yeah um, and even to this day, you know, the girls that I work with who are a variety of nationalities will come up and say, Melanie, we love you. And I, and I didn't realize that she's gone. So that's, that's terrible. But uh, yeah, no, that's um, crazy stories, Lane. Crazy yeah. Stories. And, you know, and there's some stuff I'm working on. Um, I had a meeting just before Christmas with some uh, Broadway producers about the possibilities of producing a LaBouche musical and not in the fact or not exactly like just the music but to tell the story the story of LaBouche you know um, of how we met how we began how mm -hmm. we rose to the success how the tragedy you know the drama of it all mm -hmm. and so I'm in the process of writing that now right um, and of course I think there'll be a book right cool um, because people won't believe some of the stuff you know that's that's happened to us over the years Right. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of untold stories still. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, some, that, some that I'll take to the grave. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you, uh, you, I know you sent me a couple of tracks, um, tracks that you're working on. Yeah, I right? do that. What are you working on? Uh, I'm just writing, man. It's like, um, uh, I'm just writing. There's uh, um, my, my girl that I work with, Belle, and my other uh, producer guy, um, Brad, who lives in Holland. Um, we're just constantly in the, the throes of like creating and either for ourselves or for other artists um just looking for that elusive hit right right i know that you released a couple of songs uh, a few years ago one night in heaven mm -hmm. that after night yeah. those are great songs i yeah. play them all the time on yeah. the radio shows and everything a lot of good feedback yeah just trying to get them out there man yeah that's yeah. good um before we go just want to ask you what is um what is one life lesson that you've learned that you would want to pass on to to other people? Well, the one thing that I around would say to people is is to live for today. Yeah. Reach for tomorrow mm -hmm. and learn from yesterday. All right. That's what I try to live my life by. Right. Very deep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Lane McRae. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you.